Hi hey everybody. The focus of this lesson today will be Renaissance humanism and art, essentially the intellectual developments of the Italian Renaissance. The objectives are to explain how the revival of classical texts contributed to the development of the Renaissance in Italy, the political, intellectual, and cultural effects of the Italian Renaissance, and how Renaissance ideas were developed, maintained, and changed as the Renaissance spread to Northern Europe. So I want to start out first of all with one of the important key concepts is that a revival of classical texts led to new methods of scholarship and new values in both society and religion. And so I want to kind of highlight uh, for this lesson, we want to talk about the classical texts. Uh, they are the texts written by the ancient Greeks and Romans. And this new interest that developed in the late 13 and early 1400s in these texts are going to lead to new methods of study, uh, new universities, and an emphasis on the liberal arts and so forth. So with that said, I want to talk about the general ideas. First of all, the scholars that study these works were known as humanists. And Renaissance thought embodied this approach. Uh, humanism entailed the synthesis of classical literary forms into the educational system. And once again, we know responsible you know, for the recovery and interpretation of these classical texts. Uh, many of the humanists tried to copy this ancient Roman lifestyle, and the most notable example is Petrarch. Uh, Petrarch is generally known as the father of humanism, and as this father of humanism, you know, he upheld the Roman uh, rhetorician, uh, rhetoric person. Uh, Cicero was an ideal for poets and orators, and he, you know, strived for this, this lifestyle. He was really the word Renaissance wasn't actually used until, I think, the 1800s, uh, but he was one of the first of that era that actually said, we are living in something different. This is a new era. Um, like I said, he you know, tried to dress and act the part, and he's most known for his uh, the invention of what we call the sonnet, this literary form of a poem, and he often wrote about uh, supposedly his love, Laura, who died during the plague, kind of reflecting these, the influence of the plague on Renaissance Italy. In addition, one of the ideals of humanism is philology. And as we talk a little bit about philology and what philology is, um, first of all, let's talk what it's not. It's not philosophy. That's not a typo in the word, but rather philology itself is this, I, it's what I would call the study of words um, and the idea of, of looking at that. And so our best example for philology would be the example of Lorenzo Valla. Uh, this is a, a good example. So there was a document uh, called the Donation of Constantine that the Catholic Church used to actually um, show that the, the papacy had claims to secular authority in Italy. And this it was supposedly signed by Constantine, Roman emperor during the 300s. Lorenzo Valla utilizing the study of philology proved that this donation to Constantine was a forgery. And the way he was able to do that was some of the words that were in this donation to Constantine weren't in existence in the 300s. I think words such as fief and serf that didn't exist. And so once again, another good example of these, you know, new ways of studying, new ways of learning things. Another big emphasis of the Renaissance uh, humanists were individualism. And Renaissance, this was a change from medieval work. So medieval philosophy prior to humanism was something called scholasticism. And scholasticism was generally trying to reconcile faith and reasoning. But if it seemed as if the reasoning didn't match the faith, then they had to redo the reasoning. Okay. Renaissance humanists were not anti-church. They were just more secular. And so they do focus more on this individualism, um, more concerned with the present world. Um, worldly achievements. And once again, we see this focus on the humanities because of that as well. Another characteristic is, of course, as I said earlier, secularism, you know, the, the worldly religion, worldly achievements that are going on. And once again, I do need to reemphasize this was not an anti-religious movement, uh, but it was just a different form of study. And uh, give you kind of an example, another example of that is the humanist writer Pico della Mirandola. Uh, you know, he believed there was really no limits to what humans could accomplish, that humans could do more. 
And Renaissance people you know, were, were more concerned with money and pleasure. Vala wrote another tract called On Pleasure, which defended the pleasure of the senses as the highest good. And some of you may have heard of Boccaccio. His name has been more uh, recent because of the uh, pandemic. But Boccaccio, in Boccaccio's Decameron, he portrayed an acquisitive and worldly society in reaction to the Black Death. And the church did little to combat secularism. In fact, many popes were Renaissance patrons and participants. And so we don't really see much going against it. In fact, this idea continues to grow. And finally, like I said, we also see educational changes. Uh, we see at the heart of humanistic education was, you know, these ancient Greek and Roman texts. And they, it fostered the study of the liberal arts, um, grammar, rhetoric, history, and moral philosophy as a means towards the perfectibility of man. Um, and like I said, these the Latin texts were really central to this classical revival. And, you know, we're going to see the, you know, this whole idea of education uh, for topics that were non-church related continue to grow. Another idea that supports this, uh, this new value, is the idea of civic humanism. And Renaissance humanists endorsed this notion. Um, new values were applied to resolving social and political problems. And so the two, one of the better examples that um, I want to talk about is that of Castiglione. And so this whole idea of civic humanism, these new secular political and individual behavior guiding these problems, is best expressed in Castiglione's uh, The Cordier, as well as Machiavelli's The Prince. Castiglione wrote the Book of the Courtier in 1528, and it essentially defined the qualities necessary for the successful members of the ruling elite. In many respects, it combined both etiquette and political science. The most famous work, of course, is uh, Machiavelli's The Prince, and this really laid the foundation for the realistic uh, ruler. And so The Prince, uh, what it is, First of all, it's a book that's been interpreted as a blueprint for power politics without regard to public benefit, um, a guide for political leaders who sought to acquire and maintain power. And it's known for separating ethics from politics. Uh, I believe that politicians should manipulate people and really use any means to gain power. In fact, the slogan, the ends justifies the means, is often used to describe the prince. Um, Machiavelli himself did not advocate this amoral behavior, but this was what he viewed as working. Uh, you know, he saw that those that removed ethics from politics were and were more ruthless, were more able to maintain power. And his goal in writing The Prince was actually to convince he had been banned by the Medici for supporting a rival faction. And it was to get back in good and to convince the Medici to unite the Italian peninsula by using these methods. His model prince was the son of Pope Alexander VI, Cesare Borgia, who for a brief period had gone through central Italy, conquering with the, uh, with the assistance of Machiavelli and Leonardo da Vinci. And he saw, he saw Borgia as someone who knew how to remove these ethics, remove this from politics, and would be this model prince, this model ideal. Um, and, you know, he really was hoping, like I said, it would restore Italy to its greater glory. Um, it didn't necessarily do that, but his studies were really directly applicable to warfare. And this kind of, you know, just created more of a demand. And Machiavelli's ideas are going to be, continue to be the blueprint for power politics. Okay. Also central to the development of the Renaissance was the invention of the printing press. Um, number one, uh, 1450s, good date, uh, Gutenberg's printing press spreads through Europe. And of course, the most popular book was the Bible. Uh, you know, on the printing press, the, what's called the Gutenberg Bible. But it's going to have several um, effects. Number one, it's helped spread the Renaissance through the printed word. Uh, number two, the growth of vernacular literature. Vernacular is one of those words you should know. It means everyday language. And so, for example, uh, one of the earlier vernacular works was, um, pre-Renaissance work was Dante's Inferno. And this was written in Dante's native Tuscany or Italian rather than in Latin. And as we see an increase in vernacular literature, another pre-Renaissance work was Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales written in Old English rather than Latin. And we see vernacular literature is going to contribute to the development of national cultures rather than Latin being the only language people can learn. And now people can learn in Italian, English, French, and so forth. 
Moving on to the arts, and another key concept to understand, visual arts based on the ideas of the Renaissance promoted personal, political, and religious goals. And so I want to speak a little bit about uh, some of these arts and these ideas. So first off, princes and popes often commissioned works based on classical styles employing geometric perspective. Geometry was important, this new three-dimensionality. If you ever look um, at some of the uh, old medieval works, they almost look animated. Whereas the Renaissance works tend to have show more three-dimensionality, this better perspective as well. And it's real important to understand that these were commissioned. Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, they were not starving artists. They were they got repaid big bucks for the work they did. And so they based this, these ideas on these works. That's why even though they're based on classical styles, which I'll talk about in a minute, many of the works themselves were religious because of the influence of the Pope and the church with the Renaissance. Okay. Also, we'll see in the Northern Renaissance, particular human-centered naturalism, uh, kind of an everyday life and portraiture, which is also going to become important. <clears throat> the glorification of individuals, once again, related to that Renaissance theme of individualism as uh, leaders commission portraits of themselves. And then we'll also see classical styles that, you know, others with this geometric perspective, such as the architectural works. And so I want to show just two examples of domes that were created during the Renaissance. One of the earliest examples in blueprint was Brunelleschi's dome built at the Cathedral of Florence. Later on, using that as a model and going even further was Michelangelo's dome of St. Peter's Cathedral. And so we see these new ideas, this, this um, not new ideas, domes had been around, but this new use of geometry to create bigger and better uh, domes that have withstood the test for hundreds and hundreds of years. As far as sculpture, one of the earliest sculptures was Donatello, and this is Donatello's uh, David, uh, which once again kind of shows the influence of both humanism as well as religious influence. Uh, first of all, King David, uh, Old Testament king from the Bible, is the subject, but showing you know showing king david and we kind of this revival of these um you know really a revival of this uh of the um types of sculptures that had existed but had kind of fallen out during the middle ages in europe as well and you know donatello used these naturalistic forms as well anatomy linear perspective and really like i said was one of the first to revitalize it by the later Renaissance, we're going to see the works of Michelangelo. This one is called the Pieta. Um, it's Mary and a dying Jesus, or laying with her um, as well. And this is actually still on display in the Vatican. Uh, once again, much more detailed, much more attention to the uh, actual works themselves, um, the, the people themselves, and uh, you know what they're doing. This was actually, this one created really a sensation, or Michelangelo himself created a sensation in Rome when he returned at age 26, he was already known as one of the great sculptors of the day. Um, completed in Florence was Michelangelo's David. And notice the two, the, the marble David as well. And just um, huge, larger than life. And once again, although it's a religious subject, it's glorifying the individual. You see the, the muscles, you see the body itself, the perfectibility of humans. Moving on to painting. Um, early period was a painter named Masaccio, some of the, the kind of the bridge between the medieval period and the Renaissance. But the middle Renaissance period, the greatest um, painter was Sandro Botticelli. And once again, his works were influenced by classicism, the birth of Venus, uh, using the ideals of the ancient Roman gods. You know, the Primavera, uh, showing some of the old mythology and so forth that went back into it. The later period, we'll see several other painters, uh, most known once again, Michelangelo, who's a sculptor, architect, and a painter. And two of the uh, most famous Renaissance paintings, the School, of Ath uh, School of Athens, the creation of Adam on the left, and the Last Judgment on the right. Both of these are in the Sistine Chapel. And a little bit about them. Once again, religious topics, religious subjects, but once again, notice the individuality that exists within these paintings, the, the bodies, the formations, and so forth. The uh, you know, if you look at the Last Judgment to the right, all the different unique people. And the same thing even if you look at Michelangelo, uh, the creation of Adam to the left. Side note, a little fun about the uh, creation of Adam. 
there was a cardinal uh, in particular who harassed Michelangelo. I think at one point he commissioned some works for Michelangelo and never paid him and did not like that Michelangelo had painted uh, naked people in his paintings and was forcing him to cover up some of the, those people. And Michelangelo often would draw people's faces into his paintings and he actually drew that person somewhere over here descending into hell. <laughs> but kind of a nice little payback to that cardinal for giving him such a hard time. Another important painter of the Renaissance period was Raphael. And most of you have probably seen the painting that perhaps the best example of humanism. Uh, you had the ancient Greek philosophers, the, these ideals, once again, very individualized. And if you look at the whole picture, um, you know, you see here, it seems, you know, you, you have a harder time differentiating just how complex this work is. But if you look at some close-ups, so you know, here's the detail of the center. This is Plato and Aristotle. Go back and, you know, you can see that in the main painting. Another detail, uh, uh, Raphael painted Michelangelo as Heraclitus, another ancient Greek philosopher. Another part of the detail, Euclid at the center, Ptolemy at the back facing the viewer, and Zoroaster in the white robes. And you can see each of these people painted as individuals. Like I said, medieval artwork, generally they were almost almost like anonymous people in the background. But even these background, not as important figures as Plato and Aristotle still continue to show their, you know, they still continue to show who they are. Here's another one of Pythagoras um, and Parmenides. And then finally, I want to conclude with Leonardo da Vinci. And, you know, whereas I said, you know, Michelangelo was an all around artist. He was a painter, he was a sculptor. Uh, he was an architect. Da Vinci was a little bit of everything. He's in fact what, we, what historians call the Renaissance man. Um, he dabbled. He was an artist. He was a painter. He dabbled in science, in botany. He studied anatomy. Um, he was an engineer of sorts. And so, of course, most of us know him for his most famous painting, the Mona Lisa, um, over to your right, which he actually died thinking this was unfinished. He, he had felt he had never perfected it to what exactly he wanted. A lot of mystery, of course, behind the Mona of Lisa. It said that her eyes stare at you. But also he's known for the Last Supper. Um, this is actually in a convent in Milan as well. That's still, you know, it's still. A... And then, you know, he studied proportions, his details of human anatomy. In fact, his ideas, this Vitruvian man and his studies of human anatomy became really the most important work until Vesalius in the 15th century. He also studied the skull, as you can see here. By the way, it was actually illegal to dissect a body. He had to do this behind the church's back. Uh, the church didn't allow for human dissection. But by studying the body, he was able to make these you know, detailed drawings, as you see, and learn more about um, humans in the world. You know, he said he was also an engineer. He made some, you know, plans for machines that could possibly fly. And he understood the use of compound springs could make a catapult stronger. Interestingly, I was talking earlier about uh, Cesare Borgia's campaign through central Italy. Um, and he was accompanied by both Machiavelli and da Vinci. And da Vinci actually had a tough time with him. Da Vinci was brought along because of his creation of these new weapons. And while creating the weapons theoretically and drawing them had one thing, watching them in use uh, almost sent da Vinci over the edge. He was, he was quite happy to leave Borgia's employment.